so we're here tonight to talk about uh, a subject that pretty much consumes uh, not only most a, a great majority of our reporting for the real news, but consumes the city of Baltimore itself, which is policing. And of course, you, you'd have to really be living under a rock not to know about the Baltimore Police Department at this point and the controversies that have consumed it. You know, previous to what happened in the death of Freddie Gray, of course, we were known for The Wire, which was supposed to be sort of, uh, sort of an expository view of, of policing. And thusly, we had a reputation of being a town that had a particularly troubled police department. But that only has become more of a problem uh, since the death of Freddie Gray in police custody and the subsequent Justice Department uh, investigation. But you know, we're not here really to recount just some of the things that have occurred in terms of timeline and events, but to talk about a subject in a more provocative manner that I think really needs to be really needs to be discussed. Because part of the problem is, I think, and one of the assumptions underlying the discussion about policing and policing in Baltimore today is, is actually, I think, in some ways uh, not accurate. And that is the idea that policing in Baltimore can be reformed. Uh, we call kind of operate under this idea and this sort of umbrella of thought that policing as an institution is something that can be tinkered with and fixed. And that if we tinker with it and fix, it, it will suddenly start to become a productive institution in the city. And we're not saying that's impossible, but we're saying that that underlying premise is what needs to be questioned before we can really tackle the problem that we're dealing with. And so Tay and I have been doing a series of stories about this under that rubric, why policing cannot be reformed, because we want to pose that question. And you know, one of the ways we sort of articulate this for people is is by noting a couple facts. I mean, anybody who has covered government or covered institutions in Baltimore knows that policing dominates uh, not only the discussion, but the resources in this city. No other institution gets more money or more leeway or more power than the police department. And no other uh, body of governance has more discretion you know, just, just for example, in, in the past year, you know, the Baltimore Police Department um, was, which, you know, was deal, lives in a town that has very little money and is always looking for money and always, um, you know, crying poverty, which is true, we were a poor town, uh, over, uh, over, sort of went over on their budget on overtime by about 40 or $50 million. You know, 40 or $50 million. Now, this was at the same time Tay and I were covering the fact that the city school system was $130 million short. Now, just so people know, the Baltimore City Police Department already gets twice the amount of money that schools get locally from our local system. So the fact that the City Police Department went over budget by $50 million, by almost the amount of money that schools were missing, uh, with very little controversy uh, in, in, the public, in government, um, you know, I think is an exemplar of why this question is so difficult. To, to, to address, and why it's so difficult to look at the police department and say, what are we gonna do? And I think part of the reason uh, that people don't, or that we can't reform it, or that we have problems with the idea of reform is because we don't really know how to characterize the department. And I'm gonna make some controversial statements about it that I hope will elicit the discussion. And one of the, one of the things, and one of the reasons uh, that I came, that we started working on this was because of the release of some body camera footage by the police department just recently. There were some very controversial drug cases. Um, and, and the Baltimore Police, uh, the public defender's office got a hold of body camera footage. And uh, the body camera footage showed officers, if you listen to the police department, staging the recovery of evidence. Or reenacting it. Or reenacting it. Right, right. right. Or um, if you believe the defense attorney's planting it, right? But there was another aspect to this, this body camera footage that really struck me. Um, and I don't know if anybody saw it. But there were minutes, not, not minutes, but hours of police officers going through lots and going through trash. And, you know, in one case, they arrested a guy who had like $10 on him and a little package uh, that they went back and they wiretapped him in prison to get it and then went out to find it. it. The amount of effort and time they were putting into this rummaging through trash. It would have been better, I think, if they cleaned up the alley for us because it would have been better for the taxpayers of the city. And let me just say this, I mean, I'm all, I'm all about serving the people of Baltimore as a reporter. I mean, this is not something I do. I, I really believe every institution serves the people who live here. So anyway, 
But when I looked at it, I said, this is really like exemplary of the futility. I mean, you've got a city with 300 homicides, not even half of them solved, maybe a quarter of them solved. Um, you know, you've got a city where, where obviously crime makes headlines every night, but why would the police be searching through the trash? You know, why would they be spending an hour uh, rummaging through garbage? What exactly good does that do them or the people of the city? And why did the police commissioner go up and defend this? I mean, while he was defending it, why didn't he, you know, make a comment like, maybe my police officer shouldn't be doing this? What good is this doing anybody? So when we saw this, you know, Tay and I had the idea to maybe use this footage to sort of explore this idea. Just for anyone who's not familiar with it, zero tolerance is a policy uh, that go, is based off the broken windows theory, which is that if you fix the broken windows in the neighborhood, the nuisance crimes, then you will be able to fix the larger crime issues. So zero tolerance led to people being arrested for things like expectorating, which is spitting on the ground, or having an open container of beer, or being in a neighborhood and you would be asked to present your ID and you didn't live in that same neighborhood, and that neighborhood happened to be designated a high crime area, that could lead to you being brought into central booking. So zero tolerance at its height, I think around uh, 2009, had over 105,000 Baltimore City residents. 2005. In two, it was 2005? Mm -hmm. Uh, 105,000 Baltimore City residents processed. So in a city of 630,000 people, having a over 100,000 people arrested is absolutely egregious. And what did it lead to? Well, it actually led to a lawsuit by the ACLU saying that these arrests were unconstitutional. And later the Department of Justice showed the same thing, which is that our Baltimore City Police Department has a practice of unconstitutional and racist policing tactics. You fast forward to, to 2015 and the death of Freddie Gray in police custody. And that too is very interesting because of the narrative you hear about it versus the reality of what went on. You know, Tay and I sat in the courtroom during the entirety of, of the Freddie Gray trial. And what, you, what was reported, and what was reported by the mainstream media, was this sort of mysterious case, like what happened, you know? Right, as, as if it was a whodunit, as if we had no idea yeah. how this young man ended up dead. And with really very little questioning of, of the fundamental facts of the case, which is why on earth would police stop a van six times, right? You know, this idea that somehow they were going through this um, administrative orthodoxy of opening the van and not opening the van, and you know, we, like as if there was something just normal about this, you know, the police. But, but and as if there was something normal about chasing a young man down the street early on a Sunday morning, as if it was perfectly normal for him to be worthy of being chased, worthy of being detained, worthy of being arrested, simply because he saw an officer and got scared. So the actual point of arrest itself, whether or not it was justified later, police officers said, well, he had a pocket knife on him. Well, unless they have x-ray vision, there's no way they could know this young man had a pocket knife on him. All he did was see a police officer and said, I don't want an interaction with them, which I think is very understandable for a young black man in Baltimore City to not want an interaction with Baltimore City police. So even at the very point of intersection, you could see the community questioning what was the justification, let alone what happened to this young man, where Stephen was talking about the six stops. We recently went to the trial board hearing uh, for Lieutenant Brian Rice, as well as um, Officer Goodson, who was the wagon driver. And as we sat in the trial board room, we got to hear a lot of the things that we didn't get to hear in the courtroom because they got to plead the fifth. And what we heard in the trial board room was um, incredibly disheartening because we heard the story of the torturous death of a young man. When, when I was in the courtroom, I heard about the injury in detail, and I won't go into great detail right now about it because it is incredibly graphic, but that he slowly lost control over his body in that uh, he, lost, he lost control over his legs, then uh, his lungs, and it was basically as if he was slowly suffocating in the back of this van. And so hearing Officer Goodson say he didn't remember or he couldn't remember the names of people while he's talking about why he kept on opening the back of the van, not looking in, closing the van, and then driving with it, making a series of six stops. 
I can tell you it is very unusual for an officer to be driving on the way to central booking and check on his detainee six times. That is a highly unusual practice. So the, the trial board hearing was incredibly illuminating and of course incredibly disappointing because as we know, not only were there no criminal charges that were applied effectively, but there are no disciplinary charges. Goodson has walked away cleared completely. He will have suffer no administrative discipline. He will not lose his job. And as a matter of fact, Officer Porter, who is one of the officers there, I found out that he's a detective now. So he actually received a promotion, and I assume a rate. So the Justice Department comes to Baltimore to investigate, after, after the uprising, to investigate the Baltimore City Police Department. And because Stephanie Rollins Blake really feels like she's run out of options, I guess, at this point, and invites him in to investigate. So, that, so they come here in about 2016. And their job, you know, they're, they're the federal government. Their job is to ride along with police officers, investigate arrests, look at all the sort of statement of probable causes, sort of review everything about the department, um, and interview officers and everything. But what's amazing, what we find out about a year later is that during this time, uh, there was a, a special task force called the Gun Trace Task Force. Right. It was a special unit. You probably heard, I'm sure you've all heard about this in some case. But I think the reason we're bringing this up is because it's re another remarkable situation. There were seven officers in this unit, and their job was to target gun people with guns. So they were targeting guns. That was their right. Concept. That was what they were supposed to. Again, be. a very interesting, like zero tolerance, very inhuman sort of idea. Just target the gun. Uh, don't police within the community. Just target a gun. Which but of course what it turned out was that these eight officers were not only targeting guns, but they were specifically targeting people who had money whether it was a legitimate source of money or an illegitimate one, and they were, and this is the direct quote of one of the officers, taxing Baltimore City residents, finding right. ways to actually take the money from them, accusing them of drug dealing, even if they weren't, and then taking that money from them. So they also were accused of overtime fraud, which means they were stealing directly from the taxpayers, and they were guilty of racketeering and some drug dealing themselves, as well as they were guilty of planting illegal guns on Baltimore City residents. So it made all of their arrests suspect. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they, 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 they did just about everything. You know, drug dealing, you know, they would steal pot from someone like, what, six pounds of pot, and they dealt right. it. And they just recently we found out that they were working with another police officer in Philadelphia. But what's amazing about this story is all of this was going on while the Justice Department was here. They were right? fearless. The federal government was here investigating the Baltimore City Police Department and the Gun Trace Task Force was not just robbing people and beating people up and doing all this stuff, but they were also stealing <laughs> overtime, you know, when they were on vacation calling in. So that overtime I just told you about, uh, they were calling in and getting it while they were on vacation. So they were getting paid $100 right. an hour to sit on a beach. Yeah, they were actually at a golf course, I think, in Rehoboth Beach while, they, while, while one of the officers was collecting overtime. Mm -hmm. So these officers were incredibly brazen. Brazen, or you have to ask yourself again, you know, what are we really doing here? What, what really is going on? I mean, after the Justice Department report came out, which was, to describe it as scathing would be nice, okay? It literally said that the Baltimore City Police Department has institutionalized race, systemically racist and unconstitutional policing, right, as a, as a way of life, as a culture. And yet, after this happened, not a single person from that police department was fired. Not a single person walked out at headquarters as our friend Sean Yosef's with a box with their boxes in their hands. Yeah, so yeah. I, I have to say even when people talk about police and they say, well it's just one bad apple. Well the Department of Justice would suggest it's the barrel that's bad. Right. And it's not just unconstitutional practices of, uh, and biased practices when it comes to arresting people. It was actually impinging on people's freedom of speech, arresting protesters uh, unjustly. Also, uh, in particular with women, and in particular black and poor women in Baltimore City, there was the unfounding of rape reports. And when a rape report is unfounded, that means a woman comes forward to a police officer and says, says I've been raped. And he writes it down on the Uniform Crime Report, which is their official uh, chart, and put marks it as unfounded. And that means it's a baseless accusation or lie, which means there's going to be no further investigation. Baltimore City was in the top five of police departments in the country for unfounding rape reports. Over a 10-year period, the number of uh, rape reports in Baltimore City had dropped by almost 80%. But the number of unfoundings of rapes had increased almost in an in in, in exact inverse curve. So you have to ask, 
what were the police was the police department doing something amazing to prevent sexual assault in Baltimore City? Or were they purposefully misclassifying the rape reports of women? Because you can make the argument that when there is a homicide, there is a body. You have to do something with it. But when there is a rape report, there is a woman that you can quiet. And that seems to be rather easy. So all this kind of brings us to the question, you know, then if this is happening and this is systemic, um, you know, what is policing really about in Baltimore? What is, it, what, what is its true function? And that's how we got to the idea of, you know, why policing can't be reformed. Because that was a question we wanted to answer. And I think uh, the body camera videos, as I said, were kind of sort of, a, we got to see something we never saw, which is, you know, just police going about their business, what they do, you know, when, when we're not kind of watching. When they think no one's when, looking. When they think it's what's So let me give you just a little bit of understanding of how policing works in Baltimore. Uh, for example, the members of the Gun Trace Task Force. Um, not only did most of them, with high school education, make $150,000 a year, but when we did our investigation, it turns out that several of the police officers in that task force had three what's known as take-home cars. So the police department gives them free cars, free gas, free repairs, and they can drive them anywhere. Many of them live in Pennsylvania. So there's a big, big financial incentive, right? I mean, where in this world can you get a job for $150,000 a year and not have any sort of education? And then secondly, you know, um, one of the things that's not talked about too much in Baltimore City finances is, is that the Baltimore City, Baltimore City government has a $3.5 billion fund sitting. But what it is for is for pensions, for about 4,000, well, 6,000 police officers who get pensions. So I'm, I'm not going to get too arcane here, but I just want to make it clear that this, there's a tremendous amount of money flowing out of this city tremendous amount of resources that is flowing into the hands of people who don't live here. So how do you make that, how do you make that work? Why wouldn't the people of the city, and the people of the city did rise up and say specifically, why are you doing this? What are you doing for us? Any sort of civic government that's run by the people would of course say this is ridiculous. We can't afford to have three billion dollars when our schools are falling apart. We can't afford to pay someone $150,000 who isn't going to show up, who's just going to come up with a bunch of guns. We can't afford to pay $40 million in overtime when crime is still rising. There's absolutely no connection between this institution's efficacy and the resources it extracts from the city. So why? Why does that, how do they, how do they make that work? How would you make that work, right? If you were saying to a community, I'm going to take 10 times more than I'm giving, and a matter of fact, I'm not even going to give, I'm going to actually make your life, perhaps in most cases, more difficult how do you make that work? You know, how do you do that? And I think, in part, they do it by telling a story about us. You know, they make a story about us. A story that starts with the story of a seven-year-old, right? A criminal. A child, right? The child as a criminal is really a story. It's a symbolic story. Not just about Gerard Mungo, but about every single person in this city. Because we're a city that can't function, right? We're a city that can't protect ourselves. We're a city that can't communicate. We're a city that can't be safe. We're a city at war with itself. And there's only one thing between us and that, which is them, right? Now that's, that's a difficult case to make, right? Because you're making a case that actually goes against the interests of the people that you're taking the resources from. So you have to be kind of trenchant. You can't stick to the same narrative. You have to construct a narrative that is compelling and convinces the people who live with it that they don't deserve anything better. And when they ask for it, uh, you know, you make it quite clear that, they, you know, that, that they're asking for something that's unrealistic, which is to be accountable and to be responsible and to follow the law and to treat the people in the city as if they matter. But you can't convince people to give up these kind of resources and give up their civic rights uh, through rational means. You have to construct a story. And the story has to be one of failure and one of lack of agency and one where we are complicit in our own demise. And I think that's what we see in these body camera videos. I mean, it's hard to explain to a city that is going through this crisis why there would be five people. Do you know how much that costs the city? Probably ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to make one arrest for a bag that I don't think was in that car to begin with. 
how, why on earth would you be doing that if your goal was to, to, to reduce crime? Why would you be doing that? What exactly would you have in mind? And that's why I think policing is an institution that functions on symbolism just as much as it does on anything else. And it functions on constructing narratives you know, out of law. Now, one great tool for that has been the drug war, right? Because the drug war gives you an extremely effective tool for that. It gives you what we, we call a, a crime of the object, a proximity to the object. If someone came right now and, and placed 20 gel caps right here, we could all be arrested, every single one of us. I sat in cases where young men got arrested for being close to a pile of gel caps, right? Put in jail for seven or eight years. But that gives you an incredible tool. You don't have to build cases based on actions that people took. You, know, you don't have to build cases on some intent that someone did. All you had to do is have a couple bags of weed or you know, a couple gel caps, and you're good. And, and you could say that the rest of this country is slowly turning to the idea that perhaps we shouldn't be having this war on drugs. That perhaps except marijuana... For current, except for our current administration. Right. <laughs> and an uh, AG session. Which is very revealing. Because you're dealing with someone who seems to be somewhat of an authoritarian. So it's interesting that he really loves the war on drugs. So, anyway. But um, despite the fact that we've had multiple states decriminalize or even legalize marijuana, the number of drug arrests in the country has actually gone up. So we had 1.57 million drug arrests last year, which is an almost 6% increase. So even while our country as a whole socially has decided, you know what, maybe we don't want to move forward with this drug war. The mechanisms that are at play keep moving. The wheel keeps turning and keeps grinding more people into our criminal justice system. So, and just to kind of, you know, go into the last point of this, um, that, that will sort of, that sort of became to me the proving ground of this idea, was a case that Tay and I covered together in a small town on the eastern shore called Pocomo, which is um, down, like, sort of west of Ocean City. And a friend of mine who was a homicide detective named Kelvin Sewell, uh, retired and took a job as a police chief of this town, 5,000 people, 4,000 people, half African American, half white. And um, Tay, you want to tell a little bit? So. Uh, sure. Well, Pokemon City is incredibly small. It's about 4,300 people, split evenly demographically between African Americans and whites. Um, it looks kind of like Mayberry. It really does. It's got a little main street with tiny little shops on it. Um, all the houses sort of look around, uh, I guess you could say, uh, the average person there is working class. You know, there's not any big McMansions there. Um, and Pocomoke City, as I spent time in there, I got to know the people, got to really like them. When Stephen got a phone call finding out that their yeah. black police chief, who was the first black police chief this community ever had, was being fired, the community showed up en masse at City Hall to well, ask he, why. He had been down there for four years. Crime had gone down. He'd done a by, really good job. By 80%. He had, he had instituted what we all call community policing, although I really don't think there's any other way to police but with the community. I, any other thing is military, right? So he had gone down there. He got his officers to walk the streets, get to know the people, crime had gone down. One day he gives me a call and he says, Stephen, they're going to fire me. And I'm like, why are they going to fire you? You're doing a great job. And, and then Tay and I went down there and started covering it. And the city council, which was all white, would not say why. But over time, um, you know, it became clear that this was a racial case, and especially because of what happened with the Worcester County drug test. Maybe you could tell a little background on that. Sure. Um, well, Kelvin had brought in a couple African-American officers that he had known or had recommended to him from Baltimore City. Uh, one, uh, one African-American officer that he had, he sent to the Worcester County Drug Task Force, which is actually somewhat of an elite job. It means a pay raise. It's kind of an elite unit. And he was also going to be the first black officer ever to be placed on the Worcester County Drug Task Force. So we have a lot of firsts down there on the eastern shore. Well, this young man started receiving texts from his fellow officers saying things like, what's your body count, my N? Or he got... Um, food stamps with President Obama's picture superimposed on them. Things that were, I guess you could call racial hazing, if you want to be extremely generous, or you could say it was an incredibly hostile work environment that he felt uncomfortable with, which is what he did. He said he didn't, he would appreciate it if you please don't use the N-word around me at work, please stop showing me videos, 
using the M word, I appreciate if you wouldn't do this. Well, instead they continued it and upped it. Uh, one of the officers drove him to a place that's known as KKK Lane to point out to him that this is where lynchings used to happen. <coughs> so he filed an EEOC complaint. What happens next is he had a bloody severed deer tail placed on the windshield of his car, which I assume is the Eastern Shore version of being told you're a rat. So with this EEOC complaint, he went to Kelvin, who was his former police chief, and said, I need help. Kelvin stood up for him, and we believe that is why Kelvin ended up being Getting fired. Fall. So the town just basically um, rose up because they loved Kelvin. They loved the way he was policing. It was non, you know, it, it was not a militaristic. It was community style policing, and it was effective. So we're going to show you a quick video. Last video. This is Taya Graham reporting for the Real News Network in Pocomoke City. I'm here inside City Hall in Pocomoke City, Maryland, waiting for the supporters of Mayor Bruce Morrison and former police chief Calvin Sewell to square off. It began with apologies and reconciliation. We want to see this work. I'm willing, as a mayor, to work with you. I appreciate all the people that's been coming. The supporter of Pocomoke City's first black police chief, Kelvin Sewell, and the backers of Mayor Bruce Morrison seeking to heal the racial wounds that had opened since Sewell's fire. I don't look at color, and I do not appreciate somebody saying I don't. I don't. I love every, every person in this room. I love every individual. But I am not a racist. The mayor even apologized to the media, who were kicked out of City Hall a month ago when the divisions between the black and white residents of this small eastern shore town first erupted after Sewell was let go without explanation. The taxpayers of Pocomo wanted to speak that night. I thought they had more right to be in this room than the news media. I asked the news media to leave. I got in trouble. I'm in trouble right now with the Attorney General's office. But as the meeting progressed, tensions mounted as the issue of whether or not Chief Sewell would return could not be resolved. He was terminated doing the, a job that we see as being substantially well and we can't find anything else out because of the attorneys right. for why this happened. Supporters of the chief withdrew the petition for the mayor to We're resign. Citizens for a better Pokemon, we will not present our position for the removal of the mayor of Pokemon City. But asked that Sewell be reinstated. Would you work with us? We're asking the question with you. Would you work with us, with the majority of the citizenship in fulfilling our request to reinstate Kevin D. Sewell as chief of police of Pokemon City? Mayor Bruce Morrison responded that Sewell's return was unlikely. But as mayor of Pocomo City, I feel that the town has been damaged. There's too much litigations out there. Um, everything has been said, everything's been done. My, this is only my opinion. I just don't feel that right now we can do that. that bring, I would cheat Sewell back. I don't see that happening. And when the public finally weighed in, the underlying tensions that have engulfed the town's African-American community boiled over. Like I said, if he's done something under, underneath the covers or something, that's his business. That is his business. I don't think he's done that either. But what I'm saying is, is all we see from this man has been nothing but good. The conflict was in part driven by the question that still lingers and still remains unanswered why Sewell was fired. We have not really gotten an answer to this one question. Was Chief Sewell incompetent in some way? Why was he fired? We keep getting a personnel issue, but that's not satisfying the people. We have a right, I feel, to know the reason the man was fired. But when city officials refused to elaborate, Connie Parks, the mother of Pocomoke Police Detective Franklin Savage, came forward. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you where it all came from. Detective Savage is one of the officers Sewell's lawyer says he refused to fire after they filed discrimination complaints at the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. My son, Detective, doing an excellent job. But you know what? When he started being called nigger, which nobody likes that ugly word, he complained. And when he complained, he had to come back here to work because he felt like he was working in a hostile workplace. And who wouldn't? Who, would, who wants to be called nigger on the job at a police officer? Who wants that? No one. That's what happened. Then he came here and then 
I don't know who called himself pulling Chief Sewell's chain or whatever, jerking him around, wanted Chief Sewell to fire my son, Frank, and fire Lieutenant Green. That's what happened. That's why Chief Sewell lost his job. That's it. And from that point, emotions ran high as residents vented frustration that had been building for weeks. A lot of us are upset because we don't know what's going on. It feels like everything's secret. Everything's hush -hush. It's not, it's man, But no, that's what it feels like. I I'm know not you saying that's what it is. It's not what it feels like. Including second district councilwoman Diane Downing, who said she had not been appraised of the details as to why Sewell was terminated. You saw something that I didn't see. <laughs> It was a taut encounter that embodied all of the underlying conflict in the town between race and politics and faith and community. Pastor Kathleen Moore confronted First District Councilman George Tasker, who was accused of referring to the city's black population as you people at the city council's last meeting. Pastor Moore invoked faith and God as a path for truth. I can't see. How oh, you can sit there oh all right. as a man of God Jesus. and not straighten this up. Mm -hmm. Because what you've been called to do bypass what this is. Yes. Jesus. Yes. Because you belong, you are a man of God. Mm -hmm. You're chosen and divine, called by God. Yes, I am. And you have to speak of <clears throat> Whether you truth. are or not. You have to speak truth. Mm -hmm. what? He was a good man. There's no doubt about it. He is, yes. Him and I were friends. Yes. But the morning we had to do it, I said, friend, I have to put friendship aside because I have to do what the people of Oklahoma City elected not me to do. Me. And that's what's out of the city. No. After the meeting, we talked to Councilwoman Downing about her concerns. She told us she often was not privy to key information and left uninformed when the council meets privately. There probably are a conglomerate amount of meetings that I wasn't invited to because they sometimes talk among themselves and they talk before a meeting and they might say something so all of them are privy to whatever they're talking about and I don't get that and I walk in and everybody's quiet. Here outside of City Hall, the crowds are gone but the divisions within the community remain. The confrontation between the supporters of Mayor Bruce Morrison and the supporters of Chief Kelvin Sewell is at a deadlock. Residents say it was like watching a close-knit family be torn apart. But the question lingers, will this community ever be able to heal and will their chief ever be able to return to his post? This is Taya Graham and Stephen Janis reporting from Pocomoke City, Maryland for The Real News Network. So Kelvin files his lawsuit and files his EOC complaints, and they're sustained. And the federal government joins his lawsuit against Pocomoke, saying that he was indeed discriminated against. But during that, after that lawsuit, so about the same time, the state prosecutor of Maryland, Emmett Davish, begins to investigate Kelvin. And what he does is he contacts Bo Oglesby, who is the state's attorney of Worcester County, who is the person who was the subject of the discrimination complaints. And Bo Oglesby rummages through traffic cases going back three or four years and finds a case in 2014 when uh, a man s drove into a parked car and drove around the corner and parked at his house and called police. And so Emmett Davitt puts the full force of the state prosecutor on this case. They investigate it and they indict Kelvin and then they convict him of failing to charge this African American right. uh, man uh, for hitting a parked car. He actually gave Pocomoke City residents his cell phone number. Now can you imagine having the chief of police cell phone number and being able to call him? His community policing worked so well, he would joke with me that he knew about the crime before it happened because he would have three or four people call him to tell him who was going to commit the crime. Right. He really had that kind of connection. And when Stephen talks about community policing, there were a lot of things he did. Uh, for example, on Halloween, he would uh, drive, have the police car, put the siren on, ha and hand out candy to the kids. 
He'd have groups of kids come into the police station. He said he would make a point of choosing the smallest kid in the group, putting them up at the front of the podium, putting his police chief hat on him, and saying that he could be the po a police chief one day. He made a real point of interacting with the community, with the kids, and getting to know people there. Now, I'll leave, we'll leave you this final thought. So when Kelvin was facing trial, um, the fraternal order of police, we'd call them and say, are you going to support him? Because, you know, he's a police officer facing trial. They would not call me back. They would not say a word about it. But during the trial of Freddie Gray, the FOP was there every single day, and including up into the, the administrative trial. They were there every day. They were in the media saying these officers were innocent. They did nothing wrong. But they wouldn't say a word for Kelvin. And helping fund their defense. So uh, the, the basic conclusion is, I think the, 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 what Kelvin did wrong in Pokemon was that he didn't tell the right story, right? He didn't have the Worcester County Drug Task Force going in there creating failure. You know, he wanted to work with the people there and make their lives better. And because of that, he ends up getting charged as a criminal. So what does that tell you about the criminal justice system, the way it's formulated and what it's about? There's no other conclusion you can reach. This is not like the bias of a reporter. This is a story that happened. All of this is true. This isn't a wire, you know, which is a bunch of BS. This is what happened to people and their lives. So anyway. We appreciate your time. Absolutely. If you have any questions or anything, thank you. So that's it.